They were heading down a steep grade on Highway 99 when Isabel said, look. Esperanza leaned around the side of the truck. As they rounded a curve, it appeared as if the mountains pulled away from each other like a curtain opening on a stage, revealing the San Joaquin, Joaquin Valley beyond. Flat and spacious, it spread out like a blanket of patchwork fields. Esperanza could see no end to the plots of yellow, brown, and shades of green. The road finally leveled out on the valley floor and she gazed back at the mountains from where they'd come. They looked like monstrous lion's paws resting at the edge of the big ridge. A big truck blew its horn and Juan pulled over to let it pass, its bed bulging with cantaloupes. Another truck and another one did the same. A caravan of trucks passed, passed them all piled high with round melons. On one side of the highway, acres of grapevines stretched out in soldiered rows and swallowed up the arbors. On the other side, fields and fields of dark green cotton plants became a sea of milk white puffs. This was not the gently rolling landscape like Aguas Calientes. For as far as the eye could travel, the land was unbroken by even a hillock. Esperanza felt dizzy looking at the repeated straight rows of grapes and had to turn her head away. They finally turned east off the main highway. The truck went slower now and Esperanza could see workers in the fields. People waved and Juan honked the horn in return. Then he pulled the truck to the side of the row and pointed to a field that had been cleared of its harvest. Dried rambling vines covered the acre and left and leftover melons dotted the ground. The field markers are down. We can take as many as we can carry, he called back to them. Alfonso jumped out, tossed a dozen cantaloupes to Miguel and stepped up the running board and slapped the top of the truck for Juan to start again. The melons warmed by the valley sun rolled and somersaulted with each bump of the truck. Two girls walking along the road waved and Juan stopped again. One of them climbed in, a girl about Miguel's age. Her hair was short, black and curly and her features were sharp and pointed. She leaned back against the side of the truck, her hands behind her head. And she studied Esperanza, her eyes darting at Miguel whenever she could. This is Marta, said Isabel. She lives in another camp where they pick cotton, but it's owned by a different company. Her aunt and uncle live at our camp, so she stays with them sometimes. Where are you from? asked Marta. Aguas Calientes, El Rancho de las Rosas, said Esperanza. I have never heard of El Rancho de las Rosas. Is that a town? It was the ranch they lived on, said Isabel proudly, her eyes round and shining. Esperanza's father owned it and thousand, thousands of acres of land. She had lots of servants and beautiful dresses and she went to private school too. Miguel is my cousin and his parents worked for them. So you're a princess who's come to be a peasant. Where's all your finery? Esperanza stared at her and said nothing. What's the matter, silver spoons stuck in your mouth? Her voice was smart and biting. A fire destroyed everything. She and her mother have come to work like the rest of us, said Miguel. Confused, Isabel added, Esperanza's nice, her papa died. Well, my father died too, said Marta. Before he came to this country, he fought the Mexican revolution against people like your father who owned all the land. Esperanza stared back at Marta unblinking. What had she done to deserve this girl's insults? Through grit gritted teeth, she said, you know nothing of my papa. He was a good, kind man who gave much of his property to the servants. That might be so, said Marta, but there were plenty of rich who did not. That was not my papa's fault. Isabel pointed to one of the fields, trying to change the subject. Those people are Filipinos, she said. They live in their own camp. And see over there, she pointed to the field down the road. Those people are from Oklahoma. They live in Camp 8. There's a Jap Japanese camp, too. We all live separate and work separate. They don't mix us. They don't want us banding together for higher wages or better housing, said Marta. The owners think if Mexicans have no hot water that we won't mind as long as we think that no one has any. They don't want us talking to the Okies from Oklahoma or anyone else because we might discover that they have hot water. See? Do the Okies have hot water, said Miguel? Not yet, but if they get it, we will strike. Strike, said Miguel. You mean you will stop working? Don't you need your job? Of course I need my job, but if all of the workers join together and refuse to work, we might get better work. We might all get better working conditions. Are all the conditions so bad, said Miguel? Some are decent. The place you are going to has is one of the better ones. They even have fiestas. There's a, Jama a Jamaica this Saturday night. Isabel turned to Esperanza. We all love Jamaicas. We have them every Saturday night during the summer. 
There is music and food and dancing. This Saturday is the last for the year because soon it will be too cold. Esperanza nodded and tried to pay attention to Isabel. Marta and Miguel talked and grinned back and forth. An unfamiliar feeling was creeping up inside of Esperanza. She wanted to toss Marta out of the moving truck and scold Miguel for even talking to her. Hadn't he seen her rudeness? She brooded as they rode past miles of young tamarisk trees that seemed to be the border of someone's property. Beyond those trees is the Mexican camp, said Isabel, where we live. Marta smirked at Esperanza and said, just so you know, this isn't Mexico. No one will be waiting on you here. Then she gave her a phony smile and said, in intendias, understand? Esperanza stared back at her in silence. The one thing she did understand is she did not like Marta.